All of us is going to be challenged with something in life. We don't get to decide the challenge. Mine was 27 years of false imprisonment. When I see a 10-year-old kid dying of cancer, that's not going to live to see 11th birthday. Hey, man, I got to call my blessings. Hey, I want to give a big congratulations to somebody really special to me, Marty Tankliff. He has joined Barkett, Epstein, Kieran, Aldea, and Loturco LLP as special counsel. Bruce Burkett was one of the attorneys that fought to free Marty. So Marty, congratulations on continuing your tremendous and rewarding career. So proud. Valentino Dixon grew up in downtown Buffalo. Now, as a child, Valentino was a gifted artist who loved to draw. But then one night, August 10th, 1991, his world, well, it was turned upside down as he was wrongly accused of shooting and killing Toriano Jackson at Louis Texas Red Hots restaurant in Buffalo, New York. Now, as a product of all of that, he wound up sentenced to 38 and a half years to life in prison. Today, Valentino and Marty Tankliff, who is now an attorney himself, was wrongly convicted and served almost 18 years before being exonerated of killing his parents, are joining me today to share their story. So guys, welcome to Fill in the Blanks. So glad to talk to both of you. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing great, Dr. Phil. It's uh, great to see you again, especially under much different circumstances. Yes, much different circumstances. And Valentino, I'm proud to meet you and proud to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Marty, tell everybody where you were last time we talked. I was in a New York State prison serving a sentence of 50 years to life, where my first parole board appearance would have been October of 2040. Wow. So had my conviction not been overturned, had I not been exonerated, I would still be in a maximum security prison cell right now as we speak. This situation is absolutely beyond belief. You woke up on the first day of your senior year in high school and sadly discovered that your mother and father had been brutally stabbed and bludgeoned. Your mother, Arlene, was dead. Your father, Seymour, he was fighting for his life. And you called 911 and gave first aid to him, but he later succumbed, correct? And that is all correct, yes. Tell us what happened from that point forward, you wake up that morning, you find them. After calling 911, uh, law enforcement showed up at my house pretty quickly. Uh, I had some family members who showed up, but I was isolated. I was separated. And instead of me going to the hospital where I wanted to go, where my family demanded I go, I was taken to police headquarters. And instead of being with my family, my father, I was interrogated for countless hours. The interrogation wasn't audio recorded. There was no video. There was no stenographic transcript of it. And after countless hours, uh, the detective said, I confess to the brutal murder of my mother and the attempted murder of my father at that moment. And I was arrested. Uh, and that was the last day. I saw freedom for several weeks until I was given bail. Now, you were taken to the police station and you were interrogated for countless hours. How many hours are we talking about here? We really don't know. I mean, because I, all I remember, it was brought in when it was light out. And when I finally left, it was dark out. Um, and since law enforcement chose to be deceptive, dishonest, a lot of the record keeping wasn't accurate. Um, but we would say that the interrogation was probably anywhere from six to 10 hours if we had a given estimate. And a windowless room, you know, no food, no water, no contact to the outside world other than, you know, well seasoned homicide detectives. 
Now, this was Suffolk County, right? It was, Suffolk County, New York. Yeah, and this was a law enforcement agency that was under investigation for corruption at the time, including coerced confessions. Now, you didn't know any of this at the time, of course, but we know it now. We know it now, and one of the, the, the primary focuses of that investigation was K. James McCready, who was the lead detective in my case, who showed up at the crime scene in my home shortly after the 911 phone call when he wasn't scheduled to be working that day. He was supposed to be at his construction site, but he showed up in maybe a half hour dressed in a suit and tie. Wow. Now, as I understand it, there was a finding that he had perjured himself in a prior murder case? That's absolutely true. He had obtained a false confession in a prior murder case where he listed a confession that a knife was in a particular location. Um, and what ended up happening was at a later point, they actually found the real knife in a completely different location. And it was a judge, uh, Stuart Nam, who demanded the governor, which was Mario Cuomo back then, to conduct a special investigation into Suffolk County and their tactics. Uh, and it was a finding that McCreed had committed perjury, but it didn't stop him from remaining on the police force. Wow. Now, he faked a phone call and told you that your father had regained consciousness and identified you as his attacker. That is absolutely correct. And that was just one of the many lies that he told. As a 17-year-old kid being hammered by these professional interrogators in a windowless room with no food, emotionally torn down because you know what's happened to your mother and father, take me through that moment when he tells you your father has just identified you as the attacker. For people to understand, you got to have to understand being you know, isolated, separated. You're being told that, you know, that these law enforcement who I was brought up to believe in and trust in, were telling me that they had evidence of my hair in my mother's hands. And, and then all of a sudden, McCready does this fake phone call where he comes in, he goes, listen, Marty, he goes, we know you did this murder. They just pumped your father full of adrenaline, and he identified you. And at that very moment, you kind of the, the world just comes crushing down on you. There's this disbelief. And I, and I said, there's no way my father would say that. I said, the only thing, the only reason why he would say something like this, because I helped perform 911 on the first day that morning. And McCready goes, you know, kind of stop the bullshit, Marty. We know you did it. Your father just said you did it. Just tell us you did it. And that's kind of how they get false confessions. They have you starting to believe their lies. And you, you kind of almost fight with your own brain because you know what the truth is. And for me, being this innocent kid, growing up trusting law enforcement, here I have law enforcement telling me that what I know to be true isn't true. I've talked to prosecutors, federal and state prosecutors, that even in the face of DNA evidence, even in the face of confessions from actual killers, are still skeptical of false confessions they'll say, look, people just don't confess to crimes they don't commit. I mean, there are intelligent people that in the face of overwhelming empirical scientific evidence are still skeptical that somebody would confess to a crime that they did not commit. Do you find people that still look at you askance? With, without a doubt. And what I have to do is I explain to people is that I can prove to you in about a minute that you'd falsely confess to something you wouldn't do. And they kind of look at me like, how can you do that? I said, okay. And I usually do this in a very large crowd. I said, everybody who has a sibling, please stand up. I said, everybody who, when they were home alone with their sibling and their parents went out, a lamp broke, a plate broke, something broke, remain standing. Then remember when your parents came home and said, we're not going out for ice cream until somebody tells us that they broke the lamp, they broke the plate. How many in this room said they broke the lamp, they broke the plate because they wanted ice cream? Generally speaking, about 50% of the people remain standing. I go, you just confessed to something you didn't do. And all of a sudden, you kind of get these wide eyes kind of going, oh, God. And they go, that was for ice cream. 
Imagine something that's a million times worse with a threat of execution, the threat of death, the threat of imprisonment, the threat of more psychological torture, more physical abuse. You'll say anything for it to end. But then people kind of say, I kind of get it now. I go, think about it. You said you broke a lamp or a plate for ice cream. And that's when you start to get people to say, maybe I would. <laughs> you know, and, and it's one of those moments where you have to simplify it so much for people to get it. And even then, sometimes they kind of say, well, I would, that would never happen to me. Yeah, that's because they haven't been there, particularly on the heels of the trauma. And then 17 years of your life are gone. Valentino, for you, it was 27. Yeah, 27 years, false imprisonment. Well, how old was your daughter when you went in? Four months old. Wow. When you get out, she's a grown woman, right? Yes, yes. She's, she's, when I get out, she's uh, 28. What do you say to yourself about it right now as you sit there? Well, I, I have, I'm, I'm a blessed man. Right now, I'm sitting in my car. My, my daughter's running a restaurant five feet away with my grandkids and, you know, and hold on. And she became a school teacher. So, you know, my turn out a little different than other people's cause you know, but I went in at 21, Dr. Phil, and I walked out at 48 years old, you know, and I'm a strong believer in God. So God had a purpose for me. You know, you won't believe this. And I put this in my book in prison. They used to call me the black Dr. Phil. OK, because I had read over 600 books and everybody came to me for advice. <laughs> yeah, you're wearing your hair the right way. I can say that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But I mean, mine would have ended very tragic, tragic if I didn't meet someone like Marty, you know, and if I if I didn't have my art to lean on, I had my art to lean on. And it was the art that got me national attention, because after all my appeals was denied, you know, eight witnesses cleared me to crime and a confession from the person responsible. And that wasn't enough. You know, uh, you know, a lot of times authorities, when they make a arrest, you know, they cannot phantom making a mistake. And this is the problem. You know, we're all human here. You, you know, everybody makes a mistake sometimes, you know, and, and, and when you get the bad apples, the bad apples refuse to admit that they made a mistake, no matter what amount of evidence come before them. Well, so people understand, August 10th, 91, a late night fight broke out at a gathering outside of Louie's Texas Red Hots restaurant at the intersection of East Delavan and Bailey Avenue in Buffalo, New York. Now, this Toriano Jackson was shot and killed. They got an anonymous tip, and the police arrested you for the murder and for shooting at three other people. But it was just two days after your arrest that Lamar Scott confessed to the news media that he, in fact, shot and killed Jackson. What happened then? It's supposed to be a no-brainer, you know. What happened then is they took his statement and they kicked him out of the police station and told him to get his lie straight. Get his lie straight. Yeah, they didn't believe him. I mean, Dr. Phil, I, I could tell you, essentially what happens is that these law enforcement agencies get institutional blinders, um, and quite often when they have publicly announced that they've arrested someone, and all of a sudden the real perpetrator comes forward or evidence of someone else comes forward, that the person that they've arrested already, they just continue down the prosecution, right? I mean, if you remember the last time I was on your show, there was a detective who talked about false confessions and how he had never been involved in a wrongful conviction case. And, and, and we know where that has led. But we see this so often where law enforcement announces they've arrested somebody and they just, it's kind of the snowball effect. They, they, they just try to build this case around that person. And, and to me, it's what happened in Valentino Dixon's case. I mean, if you've ever heard of a case where somebody two days later voluntarily goes to a reporter and says, I did it. I lost control of the gun. It wasn't Valentino Dixon. 
I, I know almost every prosecutor, every defense lawyer I've ever spoken to said, that's when you kind of go, time out, stop the ball, let's take a fresh look at this case. And in Valentino's, they didn't. Well, is this just confirmation bias? Do they just lock in on this and they don't want to see or hear anything else? I would say absolutely yes, because if you look at you know a lot of the empirical evidence on wrongful convictions, we've seen so many innocent people go to prison, and later on, when the facts come out, we discover that the law enforcement had evidence that pointed to someone else, not the person that was convicted. And I think it's confirmation bias. I think it's institutional blinders. I think it's also a sense of if we reveal the truth, what's going to happen to some of our other cases? We'll, we'll, we'll all of a sudden we open Pandora's box. And, you know, we, we know with Louis Scarcella, who was on the Dr. Phil show uh, on, with, with you, uh, and we see what happened with him in all the cases that he was involved with. So I think that's a perfect example how there's this level of protecting their own, protecting their own mistakes. And when all of a sudden, it's hard to call it a mistake. It's more of an intentional act that we discover the intentional wrong doing the intentional act. It's deeper than just one case. Well, here's what Scarcella said. And this was in 2007, but here's what he said. I'm Louis Scarcella, and I spent about 29 years in the New York City Police Department I've investigated 241 murders, and my main objective is to get a confession that would assist the investigation into a conviction. Are there rules when it comes to homicide? No, no, there are none. I will do whatever I have to do within the law to get a confession or to get someone to cooperate with me. I lie to them. I will use deception. The bad guys don't play by the rules when they kill mom and pop, shoot them in the head, ruin the lives of their family. I don't play by the rules. There are a lot of tactics you can use. I like the emotional tools. I sat down one day and I prayed with an individual. Sometimes I would use a lie. I had a case and I said, I have your prints. You were there and that's it. He says, no, no way I wasn't there. It was like four in the morning. I had to take him to the bathroom, and he says to me, Lewis, you were right. I was there. But he kicked me, and I shot him by accident. Don't you feel better now? He's been doing 37 and a half years to life. He said, we're always accused of coercing confessions. I've been accused of brutalizing people. I was accused of taking a 17-year-old boy and banging his head numerous times against a file cabinet. It just never happened. Really good detectives are born with a sixth sense, that crystal ball in the stomach, and I have the ability to get inside a person's soul. What do you think about that, Marty? Uh, Knowing that he's been involved in, I think, think that we know about over a dozen wrongful conviction cases, I would question every single thing he said. Um, he reminds me of, you know, the detective who basically says, there's no camera on me. There's no person watching me. There are no rules that apply to me. I mean, last year we had 161 exonerations. Out of that, I believe 102 of them were as a result of police misconduct, prosecutorial misconduct, or some other government misconduct. That's a number that should scare the shit out of people because if you think about 161 exonerations in one year, and that's based on the limited number of people who are doing this work, how many other innocent men and women are sitting in prison because of people like Scarcella? Uh, And, you know, it's just a matter of breaking people down and then throwing them a life preserver where it's like, okay, you're feeling hopeless, you're feeling helpless. So now I'll tell you, tell me what I want to hear and I'll get you out of this situation. The number one tool of the abuser is isolation. It's clearly abuse when they're doing that. That's what I think Lamar Scott's confession two days later is so credible. 
It wasn't involved in it, had no law enforcement whatsoever. It was completely voluntary. He reached out to somebody because I think in deep in his soul, he knew he could not allow Valentino to go to prison for a crime he committed. He didn't trust law enforcement. So what did he do? I guess back then, maybe the next best thing was go public and say, I did it. And the scariest thing is that when he was arrested again for another murder, uh, I think he made some kind of statement along the lines is, had you listened to me way back when, when I said I committed this murder, I wouldn't have been able to commit this crime. Yeah, of course. And Valentino, you had a bunch of eyewitnesses, which we know eyewitness testimony is often involved and not very reliable at all. But you had eyewitnesses that said you did it, even though you had somebody confessing. I'm really curious, and I think our listeners and viewers are curious about what you were saying at the time when the shooter was saying he did it and they were ignoring him and prosecuting you. Well, Dr. Phil, I come from a very bad neighborhood, a lot of stuff going on there. And I had to ask myself, you know, was I in the twilight zone? You know, because I up until now, I, I've been around a lot of people in the, in the hood, as they would say, that do some awful things. I grew up with a lot of these people, but I never knew that these type of humans existed. Someone that would actually get on the stand and lie about a murder case. You know, it was later proved that they were coerced by the prosecution. You know, and but also I had eight witnesses that cleared me. So it was over 90 people that witnessed the shooting, Dr. Phil. So it was at a public restaurant. And, you know, you just can't you just can't ignore that type of evidence. Eight eyewitnesses. And I took a polygraph test and passed it. Did this get to you emotionally? Were you angry? Were you depressed? Were you helpless? I mean, how did you feel? Well, what happened was this, you know. It took me seven years to get my 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 focus and, and, and normalcy to a certain extent back. Seven years. And it wasn't until my uncle sent me some color pencils and some paper. And he says, hey, you know, if you can reclaim your talent, you can reclaim your life. You know, and I started drawing. And the drawing for the next 20 years is what kept me strong, what kept me going. Art was important to you before this all happened, right? Oh, yeah, I went to performing arts for art, you know, and, you know, I've been drawing since four years old. I won an art contest, you know, and, you know, but for seven years, I hadn't drawn anything, painted anything. And it wasn't until my uncle sent me those supplies that my spirit started growing, you know, because prison is a place designed to break your spirit. And, you know, I, I, I took to the art again and, and it, it saved my life. Tell me about those first seven years, because you said it took you seven years to get situated. What was going on those first seven years? What was that like? Well, it was hopelessness. You know, all my appeals was denied. You know, how is this even possible? The evidence was submitted to all of the courts, the appellate courts, the federal courts, even the Supreme Court. How is this possible that all of these educated people could ignore eight eyewitnesses in the confession? a videotape confession, you know, and we had proved that these officers committed perjury. You know, the prosecutor committed uh, prosecutor misconduct and nobody wanted to uh, fix this. You know, it was I, I almost like everybody's protecting each other. You know, I do know that the system is not designed to equip the, you know, the equipped to, uh, for a poor person. It's just not equipped uh, to represent a poor person. You know, and you have to have money to fight these cases. And without that, a public defender is just not going to work here. It's just not enough to, you know, to fight the other opposition, the other side. It's just not going to happen. Well, it's often been said that you're entitled to the best defense money can buy. I mean, this is this is the American way. This is how it goes, you know, and it shouldn't be this way because, you know, it's, these are human rights. You know, not just constitutional violations or hum human rights violations, but, you know, civil rights violations, you know. And, you know, this is why I started my foundation to fight against this, you know, to make the system more uh, fair, just and equal. You said that at one point your uncle sent you these pencils and when you got them, did you 
feel like drawing right away or did they sit there for a month? What happened? My art supplies collected dust for about five to six months, Dr. Phil. You know, I procrastinated. Yeah, I procrastinated, you know. And then one day I just said, you know what, let me try to see if I can draw a rose, you know. And I drew this rose and all the other inmates was like, you know how to draw? I was embarrassed. You know, I told none of them I was an artist. I kept it to myself. And they said, you know how to draw? I said a little bit. So, oh, no, you really know how to draw, you know? And that kind of gave me that inspiration that I needed. And there was no turning back after that. You were at Attica, right? Oh, yeah. And one of the worst prisons in the world. I was there for 23 years out of the 27 years. Good Lord. What's the worst thing about Attica? Well, the, the abuse, you know, the assaults. Officers killed inmates in there. You know, it was really bad. It got better the last three years before I left because they installed cameras. Finally, after 30 something years, they installed cameras, you know, and that cut down on 90 percent of the assaults that occurred, you know, and officers still wouldn't stop. And four of them got arrested by the FBI. And this is when we haven't had any assaults there. And I say in the last three years and I say we because I talked to about 10 inmates, you know, continuously, almost every day, every other day. That's still there in Attica. Were you assaulted while you were there? I wasn't. And I'm going to tell you why. I was very close to being assaulted, but I was a model prisoner. And I was very, I realized I had to, I had to be, I had to play chess. I had to be very smart. You know, I mean, you could get assaulted if your shoelaces is not tied and you're walking down the hallway, you know, that type of thing. You asshole, tie your fucking shoes. And if you look the wrong way, you're going to get assaulted by 10 officers. I mean, they, it was like, you know, a type of game for some of these officers. Even a, even the decent officers were upset. They were mad, you know. And I had, you know, because I spent so much time there, I spoke to many of them. And they said, Dixon, I can't wait to retire. You know, this is just too much. I want to go home safe because, you know, not all officers were bad. You know, out of, out of 10 of them, seven were, seven were good officers. The three we're bad. And this is what made the prison bad. Did you form relationships with any of the guards that was decent? Oh, yeah. I got one right now <laughs> that I just talked to last week. He's retired. You know, they, 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 they loved me, man. They loved my artwork. They respected me. And, you know, that helped me out. I mean, I walked out of prison with over 900 drawings that, you know, I never went to solitary, you know, never had a misbehavior report. I was in honor block for 23 years you know, in that prison. Uh, I'm pretty close with you. I never went to solitary. I had a few minor instances, <laughs> but I, I would yeah. echo what Valentino said. You know, there's a lot of good ones and a lot of bad ones. And, you know, to this day, I still have some relationships with some of them. And it, it's funny, one of them recently wrote a book about a high-profile individual, and he, he didn't write it under his own name, but I knew exactly who he was because of the conversations I had with him when he was in prison. And we we started to communicate recently, um, but it it's so true about how that there are some good ones. I mean, there's one I'll, I'll call him John, who used to say, "You guys leave here 24 hours a day. I'm here for eight hours. If there's something I can do with eight, my eight hours that makes your life a little bit better, that I won't lose my job, I'll do it." He said, "Because every one of you are human beings," and he had the most respect out of any guard that I ever met. And other guards didn't like it because he treated people equally. And I've always said that if there were more prison guards or correction officers that had that philosophy, there'd be more humanity in prison. Does it bring back any bad feelings on your part to see a guard or talk to a guard that you had to live with for that long? For me, Dr. Phil, I ran into two of them that worked at Attica, you know, and they both of them had this crazy look because they didn't know how I was going to, you know, and I say, hey, man, how you doing? You know, I hope everything's OK. I had to make them feel really easy. How did they respond when you did that? When you said, hey, how's it going? They, they gave me, with, you know, what? actually I ran into three. But both of them gave me a nod like, hey, nice, you know, nice to see you. And then one of the guys I seen at a carnival who was really decent with me gave me a hug. I almost forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Let me just say one more thing. You know, I've always had a great spirit. I've always loved everybody. I get along with everybody. 
And prison didn't change that for me. I had my moments where I was bitter and angry and everything, but I can still wake up in the morning and smile and laugh, man. I'm not, I'm not harping on that stuff. I'm just glad that I made it out. Too many of my friends didn't make it out. You know, some of them committed suicide. Did you ever consider that? Oh yeah, man. At least once or twice a year, you know, but I knew that I had a bigger purpose and that's what kept me going. And what was your bigger purpose? My bigger purpose was to make my family proud, to leave a legacy, you know, and to change the world in some small way. And I mean, I talk to kids now about making the right choices in the inner city, all of these kids going to prison where I come from, you know, and so for me, that's more fulfilling than anything in the world. And I was also there to help guys get their GED because I was one of the educated ones, you know, to help guys get their GED, you know, to, to counsel them about making the right choices upon um, being a released. So, Hey, for me, it was, you know, I don't have, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed, man. That's all I can say. Marty, did it ever get to you to the point that you thought, eh, I don't want to do this anymore? Yes and no. You know, I, I, I think every time I had a negative court decision, I had a window of about 24 hours where I was beating myself up down, but I knew the legacy wasn't going to be that the murderer of Seymour Arlene Tankler was their son, Marty. And every day I got up to continue fighting because I knew I was going to get out one day and I was going to expose the truth and go on to become a lawyer and make a difference in this world. And uh, I've gone beyond becoming a lawyer. Um, I'm also now the Peter P. Mullen Distinguished Visiting Professor at Georgetown University. I teach a class on, with my co-professor Mark Howard called Making Exoneree, where Valentino was the first person we walked out. And for me, I can look back and say that, you know, thank God I didn't give up. Because, you know, where would Valentino be today? Let me say one thing, Dr. Phil. All of us is going to be challenged with something in life. We don't get to decide the challenge. We don't get to decide the test. You know, whatever you know, whatever hand we're dealt with, we got to deal with it. Mine was 27 years of false imprisonment. Someone else's could be a death in the family or a health issue. You know, when I see a 10 year old kid dying of cancer, that's not going to live to see 11th birthday. Hey man, I got to call my blessings. And that's how I see it. People say, how can you think that way? I'm going to think that way because I see the bigger picture. There's always somebody that's got it worse, but that's a lot of years to have robbed from you. The spirit that you guys display is astounding. You had somebody confess two days later and then ultimately confess again. And Marty, a week after the attacks on your parents, the business partner that your dad had, by the way, he owed your dad a half a million dollars, right? He, Jerry Struman owed my dad uh, over a half a million dollars. Uh, within days, he cleaned out a joint bank account, told his family he'd be swimming with the fish, faked his death, had five aliases, fled from New York to New Jersey to California, uh, and was found hiding in a psychiatric retreat, but he was never considered a suspect after all of that. So he owes him money. Within a week... He flees, disguises himself, uses an alias. One of five he had. And was never considered a suspect at the time. No. Even though he did all that, his son was a drug dealer who had enforcers. He was someone who had hired a, a biker gang to commit violent acts in the past. He was not considered a suspect for one single moment. Uh, I've known this for a long, long time. And every time I revisit the details of it, I'm just, I'm just outraged. But you're not. I'm not because it, it's very interesting. So as I mentioned, I teach this class. And we recently had one of our students ask another exoneree, you know, do you ever regret or ever think about what your life would be like had you not gone to prison? And it was a moment that really started me thinking about the impact I've had in the last 
10, 12, 13 years that I've been free. I mean, I've been part of this class at Georgetown where I've walked three people out of prison. I've got two former students who are working the Innocence Project, paying it forward. I've got countless other former students who are going into law school looking to make a difference. I think about all those people's lives that I've touched that had I not gone to prison, where would they be? Am I angry? Am I bitter? Yes, but it's at the individuals that put me there. But as one of my lawyers said, he said, Marty, just think about this. You're 10 years free. Tom Spoda, who was the senior prosecutor who fought to keep me in prison, is in prison today himself. The chief of police that was in charge of the investigation during the, the, the reinvestigation, he himself went to prison. McCready is deceased. Two of the murderers, Peter Kent and Joseph Creedon, are deceased. The lives of so many of the people that destroyed my life are either in living hell, they're dead, or they're in prison. And as one lawyer said to me, is where are you, Marty? You're free, you're a professor, you're a lawyer, and you're making a difference in people's lives. Never forget that. What would you be doing, Marty, if this hadn't happened to you when you were 17? Where do you think life would have taken you? Uh, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I was very much into business when I was young. I had a sports memorabilia business with my dad. I had some connections to some very well-known business people back then. But it wouldn't have been what I'm doing today. Uh, You know, today... I mean, t- tomorrow night is, you know, May is the final day of my fifth year of teaching a class at Georgetown with my childhood friend, Mark Howard, that I've known since I was three years old when we went to Lovey Dovey Preschool. And this, was a, uh, th- this Mark is a man who was a tenured professor of government who got back in my life, decided to change his complete career at Georgetown, went on to law school. And in 2018, he asked if I would teach a class together, and we did. And, you know, it was four months later, Valentino Dixon walked out of prison. That's amazing. Let's put a bow around that, because what actually got this moving, these students at Georgetown were your students, right, Marty? They were, but just one little back note is that when I was in law school, That's the first time I became aware of Valentino Dixon's case. And I was working in a law firm that was trying to free him, and we couldn't do it. But I made a commitment to Valentino that there would come a day sometime in the future that I would be able to help him. And in 2018, it was that day. And when I called him up, it was probably one of the most exciting days for him and his family. And we had three young students. We had Julie, Ellie, and Noya who reinvestigated the case, did an amazing job. Um, And we can go into some details about what they did because they are three little rock stars. Well, they produced this powerful documentary and broke new ground, not only by interviewing former witnesses, but also by filming the original prosecutor who revealed information critical to Valentino's final appeal And their interview of the new district attorney, John Flynn, ended with a promise by him to conduct a thorough and fair review of the case as part of his new CIU, the Conviction Integrity Unit. And I assume he made good on that. So these students, just fueled by passion, were a big factor in getting this thing broken free, right? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, their, their passion and their dedication, I think Valentino can can speak to that as somebody who benefited from their passion. But, uh, you know, I remember very early on where, you know, everybody kind of said, oh, this is a crazy idea that Mark and Marty are teaching this class. They're getting these, you know, undergraduate students to reinvestigate it. And I think, you know, these undergraduate students that went up to see the original prosecutor, I think they were more prepared and more knowledgeable about the case than he was. And I think he felt that, you know, oh, they're just these two young women who are going to interview me, that they don't know enough about the case. And until all of a sudden you see them kind of, you know, barrage him with questions nonstop, and he revealed something that 
we had known for 25 years. And what was that? That there were uh, gunshot residue tests done on Valentino that had come back negative. And that's the first time that we had actually known about that, which essentially is a, is a violation of the law because the government is obligated to turn over any evidence that is favorable to the accused. And clearly, evidence that showed Valentino didn't shoot a gun is favorable to him, which was never disclosed. So the prosecution had that evidence. Yes. Exculpatory evidence, and they did not produce that. Nope. Wow. And, and I, I kind of remember the day when the students were in this prison and, and everything is filmed, and they come out of the prison, and they all kind of look at each other. And I wasn't there, and Mark wasn't there. And they all look at each other, and they kind of went, did that just happen? And they called us up, and we talked about it. And I don't know how quickly we let Valentina know about it, but we let Valentina's lawyers know about it. And that was a huge part of the application that was submitted to John Flynn. Uh, to secure uh, Valentino's freedom. Wow. Now, Valentino, you say you got these colored pencils, you started doing drawings, and you started drawing scenes of golf courses. Why did you make your first golf course drawing? (laughs) Dr. Phil, let me say something to you. Right? Now, I'm a black kid from the inner city. I never golfed before. I don't know nothing about the sport. You know, it's foreign to me. And the warden who knew me personally said, Valentino, could you draw my favorite golf hole? I said, come on, Ward, I never golf. We both laughed. He brought a picture in. I drew a 12th hole of Augusta. That's it right there on the screen. Right. We're looking at it. Yes, he loved it. And it's over with. It's done. Okay. He retired a couple months later. My neighbor said, hey, Valentino, you should draw more golf scenes. I said, hell no, I'm not drawing no more golf scenes. And he tossed two Golf Digest magazines on my bunk. And he says, hey, man, you know, I think there's something you should take an interest in. Well, I don't know why I did. I started looking through the magazines, the Golf Digest magazines, and I started falling in love with the golf courses. And I started drawing them every day. Fast forward six months later, I had about 40 drawings. And I sent one of them to the Golf Digest magazine with a letter explaining what happened to me. They couldn't believe it, and they investigated, and they wrote a story on me. Max Adler uh, wrote a story in July 2012, and I never stopped drawing golf courses after that. And then the Golf Channel got involved, and then national media, you know, and then Marty came and saved the day. But, But Dr. Phil, just so you know, it was that Valentino drawing a golf course, which piqued the interest of the lawyer where I was working at that time to take on Valentino's case because he loved golf. And it was, that was how I got connected to Valentino. You know, so it really is if Valentino had not decided or had the superintendent not asked him to draw a golf course, Valentino and I never would have met. Yeah, that's true. Well, wow, that's just amazing. I'm looking at this first one that you drew for the warden mm-hmm. from Augusta. I've played that hole, and that's a that's a damn good rendition of it, I can tell you. Thank you. Except you can't see all of my balls in the water <laughs> where I hit them. And it says, Michelle Obama gifted this drawing to Barack for Christmas? Oh, yeah. <laughs> How did she come by it? She saw me on HBO Real Sports with Brian Gumbel and reached out. You know, and people, you know, they love the drawings and most people think they're paintings. They say, oh, those are nice paintings. They're all pencil, color pencil. I mean, I spent 80 hours on some of these drawings. Wow. Yeah. And, and, you know, even John McEnroe reached out, you know, the great tennis legend and got two of them. So, I mean, if God don't bless me with anything else left in his life, I'm I'm okay with it. (laughs) Yeah. I see one here, Tiger. Yep, I met Tiger at the Masters. I told Tiger he was going to win in 2019, and and he won. So you actually have been to Augusta? Oh, yeah. I live in Augusta right now. I'm from Buffalo, and I live in Augusta. (laughs) So you live there now? I live here. I moved down here uh, 10 months ago, so I live in Augusta. And how do you like it? 
I love it. It's, it's you know, it's peaceful and quiet for me, and, it, and I love the weather. I mean, I, I've never had it this peaceful, man. I, you know, I, like I grew up in a rough part of Buffalo, and then I went to prison at 21. So you can, you know, I mean, imagine that. I never had no real peace until now. I can hear the birds chirp. And, and, and you get to wake up and see the sunrise over a beautiful, it looks like valley, and you get your fish tank. And I mean, life couldn't be any better. I mean, I'm so grateful. So 1991 is when all of this starts. You get convicted in 92. So you're in for 27 years. A lot changed in that time, right? It changed, Dr. Phil, but I changed with it. <clears throat> now, how did I change with the world? You know, I read tons of books, read all the magazines, looked at pictures. I quizzed people. I was not going to be stuck in 1991. I knew what type of phone I wanted to, when I got out, all that stuff. You know, so what I did, I lived in a fantasy world. The fantasy world is this, you know, what do the cars look like? What's going on with technology? You know, how is the world changing? I need to evolve with it, even though I'm in a six by eight prison cell. I'm going to talk to the guards. I'm going to talk to the new inmates coming in. I'm going to quiz them and I'm going to ask them questions about every single thing. So guess what? I'm going to live through this and I'm going to live in this fantasy while I'm drawing all these golf courses. So when I get out, I'm not going to be shocked. And I wasn't. What was the strangest thing to you when you got out? Well, the strangest thing is this. You know, the world changed a lot. People were not as friendly as they was before when I went in. I'm going to be honest with you. Okay. So that's a very saddening. It's very saddening to me because I'm a people person, you know, and society's changed in the last 35 years, big time. You know, so that's very sad. Other than that, you know, it did take me a while to learn the iPhone. I wanted to toss it a couple times. OK, <laughs> but I got I mastered it now. Uh, but yeah, I, for me, I just like to go fishing. I like to take a walk in the park. I like to do the simple things that people take for granted. You know, life. I don't have to have everything in the world. I'm, you know, I'm going to I'm going to enjoy the sky tonight. I'm going to look up and I'm going to sit outside for about a half an hour. You know, I, I, I took care of my grandmother for three years. She's 94 years old. I wanted to get out and spend a lot of time with her, you know, and really sit with her, cook for her, all these things. I have got a chance to do all of these things, Dr. Phil. So I'm truly blessed. What was the first thing you wanted to do when you got out? I wanted to I wanted to go to Red Lobster, eat some eat some lobster because I never ate lobster before in my life. <laughs> really? So, so, Dr. Phil, just so you know, so Valentina chose to have a little party at Red Lobster. But I think one of the things that made it so amazing was is that two of the students that worked on this case from George Center Free Him were from out of the United States. So Julian Ellie flew back from France and England for that day to be there part of it. And we all went to Red Lobster afterwards. And it really was one of those moments that we kind of all just sat around and said, we did it. You know, we, we helped free Valentino. What a wonderful day. What a wonderful experience. And I hope Red Lobster put the feedback on you in a big way. Well, let me say this. <laughs> I, ate, I ate two lobster tails. I ate some shrimp, you know, and it was the greatest feeling in the world. Well, that's terrific. I know I talked to one exoneree when he got off death row. And he told me the first thing you wanted to do was walk as far as he could in a straight line because all he had done was walk in an eight-foot circle for the last 33 years. And I totally understood him when he said it. I'd have never thought of it, but I understood it. There's always something that you want to do. How was the lobster? Well, I, I was hoping that you didn't ask me that. You know, it was awesome for me that day, but since then... I've ate some serious lobster in some really good restaurants. So, hey, Red Lobster, you, you, you know, you came through for me that day, but then I had to graduate. <laughs> yeah, I understand. You did, right? Yeah. I'm a fan of Red Lobster. They have their place. They do a good job, but I understand yeah. what you're saying. Marty, what did you do when you got out? What was the first thing you wanted to do? So obviously, spend time with family, but there was, during my post-conviction hearings, I was actually being held in the Nassau County Jail because the Suffolk County Jail Sheriff was my trial judge, so I couldn't be held there. And every day that the that I was being brought back from the hearing to Nassau County, we stopped off at a gas station and got a cup of coffee right near the jail. So 
the day I was freed, I asked my family to stop by the gas station so I could get that last cup of coffee ever at that gas station. And I've never been back to that gas station, never got a call, cup of coffee there. But we went back to one of my family members' homes and we, Mark flew back from France because he was in France and he wasn't going to miss it. And we had a nice little celebration at home. Well, that's got to be an amazing feeling. It's just got to be an amazing feeling. It, it is, but there's one person I just want to give a little acknowledgement to that so often I think she gets underreported, and that's Valentina's daughter, Valentina, who for many, many years, she fought to, you know, fought to advocate for her dad. And I remember about a week and a half before he was getting free, she and I had a conversation about all the hell she went through for years, for 27 years, how so many people kind of say, you know, your dad's a murderer, your dad's this, your dad's that. And I said to her, I said, Valentina, guess what? That day when Valentina gets out, you get to say F you to every one of those people <laughs> that verbally abused you for doing what was right and just. And I remember the day Valentina was getting out, I don't think I've ever seen such an amazing smile on a woman who hadn't hugged her father as a free man. And she deserves a lot of credit for, for fighting for her father for, I mean, 27 years. It, it's somebody who I like to acknowledge because she's a trooper. You guys want to see her? She's in a restaurant. I mean, she's a school teacher, <laughs> but she drove down here from Ohio three days ago to spend some time with me. She's inside the restaurant if you guys want to see her. <laughs> I would love to. Dr. Phil want to say hi. Marty, Marty and Dr. Phil. <laughs> well, hi, hello. Hi, Marty. Well, it's Dr. Phil. I just wanted to say hello and tell you how inspiring you are standing by your father for all of those years and working so hard to get him free. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You truly are amazing and inspirational. And Marty was just giving a shout out to you. And we just wanted to see you and meet you and tell you how inspiring you are. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> what did it feel like the day he walked out of that prison? <sighs> it was like um, walking out of a movie scene. It was beautiful. It was finally that breathtaking moment you know well i don't know but i can lean into imagining it did you find it easy or hard to get active in relating to him again every day when he was free i know you stayed in touch while he was in prison but did it take a while to fold him back into your life um, yeah it was it was definitely a hard adjustment um especially being so young and spending all my time um visiting him at Attica. Um, but these moments now are just so surreal. And I'm so grateful for, you know, the opportunity to be here with him. Well, Still. you're an amazing young woman. And I look forward to meeting you in person sometime. Of course. I would love that. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I look forward to it. Thanks for taking a minute to say hello. Of course. I so appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for talking to us. I appreciate it. I, I think, you know, the message that, you know, if we wanted to give a message from your listeners who are in a very similar situation is don't give up. Don't give up and, and don't, don't be deterred by those who try to stop you because they exist everywhere in life. It reminds me of some of our students who have had obstacles about, you know, college or jobs and when they walk away from our class and they see people like myself and Valentino, they kind of go, if they can succeed, so can we. If they can overcome those struggles and the hell that they went through, then we can do it too. I'm so glad to hear you say that. And you, you have the right to say it. You've earned the right to say it. You have the credibility to say it. And I just hope that people hear it, not only in their own lives, but about these people that we advocate for that are wrongfully convicted, because there have been 187 exonerations on death row since 1973. That's like one in 10 between February 6th of 2020 and 1989. There have been 2,551 
total exonerations. That's a lot of misses, Marty. And that doesn't include the 1,800 that were in these 15 large-scale police scandals. So in total, that's almost 4,500 defendants that the system got it wrong. You think about those numbers you just said. It's those are the numbers that we can identify. What about all the ones where the evidence has been lost? Right. You know, there's been statutory limitations where people couldn't file motions. Courts get it wrong. They don't have lawyers. There are some people who just don't want to keep fighting anymore, right? And if they think if we have this representation number and it's based on, you know, on the limited number of people who are doing this work, imagine how bad those numbers would be if, let's say, we doubled the amount of people doing this work. And that's something we don't want to talk about because we want to believe we have a great system in the United States. We believe that you know, these things don't happen. But 161 people were exonerated yes, last year, according to the National Register of Exonerations. About one person every two to three days. What that really leads to is that the guilty parties have remained free and have continued to victimize the communities that they live in. That's something that we need to talk about, we need to cure, we need to address. We certainly do. And you know something that I think people almost never talk about, and I think about this from a psychological standpoint, think about how many people have been executed and then the family of the victim finds out it wasn't them. And now they've lost the loved one. An innocent person has been executed, and the killer is still out there. What does that family sit around the kitchen table and say to themselves? We lost our loved one, killed an innocent man, and the killer has not been held accountable. What kind of psychological conflict does that family suffer? Which is why I say, to victims' families, look, you deserve accountability. You deserve justice. But if it's delayed because somebody wants another hearing or there's evidence out there that needs to be looked at, three months, six months to get it right, you want to get that right. If you're the victim's family, you want to get it right. You would think so. And it's more than that. You would think a prosecutor or the judicial system would want to get it right. To me, you know, what's, first of all, I, the death penalty shouldn't exist because we know absolutely we have killed innocent people, right? We just know that. Absolutely. But, but when there's evidence that somebody's possibly innocent, there was possible wrongdoing, what is our rush? You know, to me, truth overcomes finality. When you execute them, that's for a long time. You get it wrong. There ain't no coming back from that. You know, and, and think about even the the people who misidentify somebody partially because police take them down the road to misidentify someone. That person gets convicted of the crime, and the person who identified them is led to believe for 10, 15, 20 years that they put a guilty person in prison, now all of a sudden they get exonerated. That person has to deal with the fact that they've been free for 20 years and they identified the wrong person. To me, that's a psychological trauma that's going to be even more damaging because now they may have to come face to face with the person they put in prison. Well, exactly. And look, This is America, and depriving someone of their liberty is a very high standard. There are different standards of proof. There's a preponderance of evidence in civil cases, as you know, where it's just, it can be 51-49, so it's more likely than not, and it's clear and convincing. But when you deprive someone of their liberty, it's got to be beyond a reasonable doubt, where 12 people go in a room, and there's no issue over which reasonable people could differ, and you still get it wrong. That's scary, and that tells us this system needs to be overhauled. This system needs to be looked at in a serious way. 
it's still the best system I know of, but it doesn't mean that it's perfect, doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be overhauled when we're getting it wrong as much as we are. We need to be open about it. I mean, I look at Valentino's case where you've got Lamar Scott coming forward two days later, uh, admitting he did the shooting, and then throughout Valentino's 27 years in prison, I don't even know how many times Lamar Scott continued to say, <laughs> I'm the shooter, not Valentino. And then I think about when, when my students, our students interviewed Belling, he said something to the effect that, you know, there'll never come a day where Lamar Scott will plead guilty, uh, you know, and Valentino will be exonerated. Well, guess what? September 19th, uh, 2018, that day happened. I was in the courtroom where Lamar Scott pled guilty to the shooting and Valentino was free. Boy, what an amazing day. What an amazing day for Valentino and his family and for you and for those students. And I've been in some of those situations myself and it changes you when you are able to be even a small part of something like that. I was glad to meet you and be a small part of your journey and I'm proud to talk to you today. I'm so glad you're continuing to do this work, and I want to say to you again, anytime I can be of any help in what you're doing, you know how to reach me, right? Sort of. We have some mutual friends. Yeah, well, I'll make it real easy for you. I'll put it that way. Okay. I talk to Jason Flom on a regular basis. He's very passionate about this as well, as you know. But I'll make sure that we have a direct line so we can do anything that we can to help these people that deserve it. I, I would love it and appreciate it because the work we do to me, I mean, it's very interesting. So this is my fifth year teaching, and I recently had a chance to meet the father of one of my current students. And he just looked at me and he goes, how the hell did you and Mark come up with this idea to teach this class? He goes, you are preparing these students for life in ways that they can't even imagine right now. And on top of that, you've walked three people out of prison with more to come, and you've motivated these students to go work at the Innocence Project, go on to law school, work with Jason. One of my former students is actually working with Jason on his podcast crew. And he goes, and you could have just decided to go down to Florida, open up a little coconut shack on the beach. But instead, you threw yourself into the fire of law school. I mean, I've gone back into prisons where I was incarcerated at. And to me, it's been one of those weird experiences because I was recently at Clinton Correctional Facility. And within about an hour of being there, a lieutenant came down to the legal visit room, knocked on the door, and he goes, you know, Tanklin, he goes, I had to see it to believe it. He goes, the rumor was you were in the jail. And it was one of those moments where it kind of felt a little weird because I was like, yeah, I am. I'm in the jail. I'm in the jail where I was in prison for a very long time. But guess what? I'm here to fight for others. And I get to walk out of that jail as a free man. Well, that's got to be a surreal moment, right? It was because the following day I drove to another jail and it was the exact same thing happened. So it really was a weird 48 hours for me. I cannot imagine. Well, Marty, thank you for talking to us today. Valentino, thank you for talking to me today. And thank you for introducing me to your delightful and inspiring daughter. Thanks for having us, Dr. Phil. Appreciate it greatly. Thank you. I look forward to meeting you in person. And I look forward to getting together with both of you. And um, I'll buy you the biggest lobster you've ever <laughs> seen when we get together. All right. I'm, I'm going to hold you to that one. <laughs> I'm going to buy you one that will scare you until oh, they get man. it cooked. I can't wait. All right. Thanks. Marty, I'll talk to you soon. And Absolutely. I'll get you all the contact information so you don't have to go through Jason to get in touch with me. That would be absolutely wonderful. And I look forward to seeing you in person, you know, giving a big hug and thank you because you were part of the journey for me. I mean, you were part of exposing injustice and exposing some things that happened in my case, which you know what happened and with McCready and some of the statements that were made, and it really was instrumental. And, and I thank you for doing that for me because I know by you doing it for me, it will help others. Well, I was glad to do it, and I'm going to keep doing it. Let's do it together. Absolutely. 
All right. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. So okay. Long.